What's up, guys? It's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Today we have with us Bill Protzman. Bill has been a witness to the power of music throughout his whole life and speaks openly about how you can use it for your mental health. His volunteer work in the field brings him constant contact with vets, people who are homeless, and people who abuse substances. Now, I'm telling you guys this because lawyers are 3.6 times more likely to suffer from depression than non-lawyers. Chances are, if you're listening, you might have depression and you might not know it. Now, Substance abuse rates within the legal field are also pretty crazy. Um, Lawyers are much more likely to abuse substances than most other industries. The legal industry has the 11th highest incidence of suicide among professionals. This is a real problem. Uh, My guess is that many people you know might be suffering from this. We need to stop being ashamed of mental health issues and start healing. Now, If you like this episode, please follow me on Instagram, follow me on uh, iTunes podcast, and give it five stars and a review. I really appreciate the support. Let's get started. Three, two, one, let's go. Welcome to Don't Mind the Golden Handcuffs podcast or DMGH podcast. A place for future and present attorneys or any young professional to find the motivation they need to further their minds, careers, and financial success. It's hard to make it out there when you came from nothing. We want to provide you with some help with that. Of course, a one-person team couldn't accomplish this. DMGH Podcast experienced guests will guide us on this road to career and financial success. First, let's take this law thing one step at a time with your host Chris. Um, Bill, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to speak with you. Uh, the second I found out you could do this interview, I pretty much told everyone I knew. So thank you. My pleasure. I'm glad to be here, Chris. Uh, I read your book, The Value of Cultivating the Human Spirit. I recommend it to anyone starting a business or someone just that wants to understand more of, uh, I guess, how people think. That's a good thing. I'm, I'm glad you did. Positive feedback for that book is is limited and rare because I, I'm not really pushing it like, you know, yeah. all the big publishers do. But it's great when it finds an audience. And so I really appreciate that. I read it all in one day, too. I just sat down and just read from okay. the first page to the last. <laughs> so Good. Bill, I'm glad to know. <laughs> uh, tell us glad about yourself know. a little bit. So I'm, I'm basically a piano player. I'm also an entrepreneur and I've been in the IT field since the early 80s. Took a job with a small startup right out of college instead of going to B school. And so I've let that information technology track, which was 300 baud modems and stuff like that back mm-hmm. in the day, carry me and my my habit, which is music, um, up to where we are today. An interesting journey because along the way you learn that you can do two things, like you can have a sideline, yeah, even if it's making music, which for me isn't a big money maker, but mm-hmm. it certainly feels my soul in a way that I can't ignore. Yeah. If I if I don't do music, I die. Yeah. And I, I can't afford that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I love life too much to not be a part of it. Yeah. So um, putting a roof over your head, feeding the family, doing all the responsible stuff that we do is a great thing, especially if it lets you have freedom to do what you really love. Mm-hmm. And in my case, yeah, I love technology, but my heart is really in music. It's been there forever. And so I have to do that. It just feeds me yeah. in a way that tech doesn't. Yeah. And how did you get to where you are today? I mean, you wrote that fantastic book, and now you're, you're talking a lot about um, using music uh, as t- type of therapy. Can you explain a little bit how you got there? Sure. Um, I realized really early on that playing the piano for me was like behavioral health care. I could get into music with things like emotions at a level that I couldn't use those same emotions in the real world, in business, say. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't get too far out of the boundaries there. Yeah. But at the piano, I could find it and feel it. And finding and feeling those things, that's really important. We can't stuff our feelings too far. They're going to build up inside and eventually explode and leak out. So having the piano and that creative expression let me feel the things that I needed to feel and filled me up in that way. Mm -hmm. Sort of encouraged me to get back into business, right? Get back into the real world, do what I needed to do. Uh, it's funny because after I read your book and spoke to you a little bit, I started listening to songs um, that I used to love back in high school uh, and even like certain Disney songs I grew up with. And the amount of emotions that kind of overwhelmed me, I can't really get that from new music I listen to. Um, so I connected on that on a very deep level. It's it's really healthy to do that. So I'm not a music therapist. Music therapists are board certified, master's 
level degrees, usually sometimes PhD, and sometimes state licensed. That's not me. I'm just a piano player. But I came by this knowledge, honestly, and now the research that's out there, the science that's going into how they use music is catching up with musicians and yeah. what we've known all the time. You know, They yeah. actually use music to investigate what's going on in the brain. So neuroscientists play music at you, and they measure what's happening in your brain with MRIs and stuff, and they can tell because of the holistic stimulus of music, much more about your brain than like poking a needle in there and just seeing what lights up, right? Yeah. It's a fantastic tool for them, and it's giving us knowledge and research we didn't have any other way about yeah. how we think and how we move, even to the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is cool stuff. Yeah, it is. So I'm glad I'm glad to be a, a <laughs> I don't know, like a lab rat in that, <laughs> and, and to share my knowledge, because when you understand how music changes you, it's a transformational practice. Yeah, I used to be um, a musician as well. I used to play guitar, um, a little bit of piano. Uh, I played the cavaquinho, which is a Brazilian type of ukulele. Uh, yeah. And I found that like even the way you play the instrument, it just the audience absorbs it a completely different way. Um, but just getting to, to the first question, um, sure. Your book talks about best uh, best spiritual practices, and uh, I think the word spirituality gets a kind of a bad reputation nowadays because it, um, it brings you to have a certain certain um, feeling as to what it is, really. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you view the word spirituality? Sure. So uh, for me, there's a lot of things that science hasn't yet investigated and explained, like consciousness. That's a big one. They're getting there. There are, in my, in my view, four basic aspects of who we are. There's the physical aspect, of course, the mental and the emotional. And then there's this other aspect, which I call spiritual, that's sort of the catch-all for things that we can't explain any other way. That's been my ethos for a while. And when I discovered that the United States Army did a study on spirit, the human spirit, because they were interested in resilience. And what they found was that if you didn't have physical, mental, emotional, and spirit all lined up together together, you had people that weren't resilient. Yeah. They weren't ready. You know, yeah. it was, there's an, there's an aspect of readiness that goes to how is your human spirit engaged in what you're doing? Like I was talking about being a piano player and being an uh, IT professional, my human spirit is engaged in those things. Yeah. If, if you, if you don't have that level of commitment, all those intangibles, you're liable to be less than effective. Yeah. So for me, spiritual means the thing that you sweep everything else into. So what's in that thing? Well, there's things like respect there. Respect is a decent thing. Um, the army was big on respect, of course, because chain of <laughs> command, that's what makes it work. So you've got respect on the one hand and disrespect on the other. They're both spiritual practices. That is, if you are being respectful, that's one way of being in the world. If you're being disrespectful, that's another way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And the best spiritual practice is the one that has the best results. So if you're interested in getting along in the army, Respect is a good thing to practice, right? Yeah. yeah. Disrespect is going to get you nowhere <laughs> in the army. So um, that was cool. And uh, the other aspect that sort of lit me up on this spirituality thing came from an outfit called the um, – what is it called? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote the study correctly by reading it from the book. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was an interest in things like gratitude in the business world. And the Fortune Knowledge Group went out there and said, okay, let's see what makes businesses effective, really effective in these funny areas that are connected to the human spirit. And they found that things like gratitude and appreciation and stuff like that were part of effective businesses. Businesses that practiced those things just did better. Their employees were more engaged. They had better customers. They had longer term relationships. So Fortune Knowledge Group sort of encapsulated all that for us into what I now call spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. The same thing the army calls the human spirit. And it turns out that even in business, respect goes further than disrespect. Yeah. Appreciation goes further than um, whatever the opposite of it might be. Yeah. So the Fortune Knowledge Group study quantified that for us in a way where we could say, yeah, practice this stuff, you're gonna do better. Yeah. Well, obviously, right? Yeah. But we, we have science behind it now. We have research that supports it. Yeah. So that's what I call spirituality. Yeah. And so funny because in the beginning of your book, you talk about how, uh, although certain things might not have a lot of studies, you need to learn from your experiences. And now we're seeing more studies come out. So now it's kind of a double whopper in that sense. Yeah. And as a musician, you know, I've seen that for a long time. 
Yeah. Because we know that music works and uh, science is now telling us why. Yeah. So one reason I really wanted to bring you on was that depression is a huge problem in the legal field. Um, it, just alone, I know of many people that have come to me in law school that are feeling depressed. Uh, it's a very high intensity uh, uh, way to get educated. And a lot of it is um, your spirits are always being broken down by whether it's professors, whether it's your grades. Uh, students generally go into law school pretty much thinking they're incredibly smart. And then by the first month, they found out they're very average. And that could yeah. really take a beating to someone. Um, so th so that's just why I really was excited about bringing you on, um, especially in my journey too. Uh, I, I always think that spiritual health uh, and mental health, it's the most important factor of success. If you can't do anything properly for doing it, thinking that you're not good enough. Um, so one question I got by a viewer uh, was, can you explain more about how music can be used in self-care? Sure. Um, you have another question that's related to this about unipolar depressive oh, yes. disorders. Yes, let's do that one first. And that's a big old catch-all term, but basically it means that you're experiencing depression, distress, or anxiety. Maybe not at a clinical level, but yeah. at a level that impacts you in some way. So uh, you're getting squeezed, right? And law school, boot camp, whatever, we go through these experiences that just compress us, that that either stretch us out or just in other ways stress us intentionally. Mm -hmm. I mean, boot camp is there to eliminate the people who can't make it. Exactly. Let's be fair. Yeah. And in some ways, law school is like that too. Yes. You're going to get heavy pressure and that's on purpose. You want to see if you can make it, right? It's a physical, mental, emotional, maybe even a spiritual journey mm -hmm. that's intentional. It's artificially imposed on you. So how do you, how do you cope? Well, in my practice, I cope by letting it, letting the feelings come. But I do that with intention and I do it regularly sitting there at the piano playing. That's a regular practice of allowing those emotions to come up and be released. Let them come up and be released. It doesn't matter. They could be fear, anger, sadness, depression, distress, anxiety. I've dealt with suicide in my life. So those feelings come up as well. And I found that letting those feelings come up is easier with music. I can play music in safety that'll trigger me to sadness or fear or anger, whatever it is, and let that feeling play very deeply in me, inside me. And when it finishes playing, it sort of releases and it takes its negative energy with it and leaves me with good energy. So there are good things about, like, say, fear, right? Mm -hmm. Good things about anger. Fear is a, an emotion that keeps us safe. Yeah. It makes us save money, you know, yeah. for retirement. Yeah. It, there's good things about fear. Good things about anger, right? Um, if the tiger's charging you, you're going to defend your family. Yeah. And that anger triggers things like adrenaline, gets us moving, whatever. Those are those are feelings we need. So being able to use that anger well, instead of stuffing it down, will give you that edge that you need to get it done. Mm -hmm. It's really important for attorneys. I, I can't imagine what it's like to go into a courtroom if you're all scrambled. <laughs> yeah. But if you've dealt with that, if you've allowed those emotions to come up, you can take the good stuff, the fuel that's there, if you will, Yeah. take that with you into the courtroom instead of taking all of the angst. Yeah. And, and that's a way that music can really help transform those sort of negative emotions. Yeah. We like to think of them as negative, but transform the energy in those negative emotions. So you take that adrenaline in without the negative charge behind it. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And you brought, you brought up two really important things that I feel uh, is overlooked a lot. Um, first of all, mental health doesn't insinuate poor mental health. Mental health is just mental health, just like physical health. Everyone has physical health and everyone yep. has mental health. And it's, it's a spectrum, you know, like just because you're not doing amazing doesn't mean that your life is over. Just because you're not doing amazing doesn't mean that's not okay. We're allowed to feel what we're feeling. Well said. And um, the second thing you brought up was um, that really, I think, applies to attorneys and law students is that when you start law school, the first thing you're told during orientation is whatever hobby you have, let it go. This is the only thing that matters. And I feel like that leads to self-destruction in a lot of ways. Um, well, it can. It I mean, can. They're making a good observation. But yeah. you have, what is it, two, three year journey? Yeah. Depending upon how hard you go for it. It's okay to put some stuff on hold for a of couple course, of years. Of course, exactly. And but it's also okay to, yeah, exactly. As long as you have a time frame and you still have a way to, uh, like you said, like release the, these feelings. Because the last thing yeah. you want is to take a test or go into courtroom, like you said, with feelings of angst. 
So if you can't keep your hobby of being a full time artist, uh, maybe take half an hour a week and draw, you know, find a way to do it. For me, it's listening to music. And uh, I love comic books, as you can see, pretty yeah, much all around. Me. <laughs> yeah. We need that, you know, yeah. that. And, and sometimes it's the opposite. It's not as opposite as respect and disrespect. It's, it's opposite in a good way. Yeah. In a paradoxical way where you can say, yes, I'm an attorney and I love comics. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you can't go through life without both of those things yeah. being true at the same time. Exactly. And it's like right? you explained where, where, for instance, they say this in law school to put fear in your heart because they want you to understand this is going to be a very stress, stressful period. Um, so they do that for a good purpose. It's to make you ready so that if you're irresponsible, yeah. it's about time you start getting responsible. And then it's your role as individual to look within yourself and really think, all right, what can I keep in my life? Like, what can I throw out? What can I keep? The, um, I hate to use this word, but I will. So the mindset of being able to go through law school or go through boot camp, and it's more than the mindset, of course, as we know, mm -hmm. but that attitude of that way of being is a way of being you find you can put that on. So when you need to be an attorney, you put on the attorney thing and it's intense and stuff happens and you get really stressed and squeezed. But when you're done, you can take off the attorney coat and put on the, you know, some, whatever the other thing is for you. Yeah. And what you learn is that this practice of being able to change hats with intention is something that you respond to holistically, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You dial in to attorneyness for that period of time where you're going to be squeezed really hard by the practice of law. Mm -hmm. And when you're done, you take that off. And, and your system learns to respond to that. So just like the warrior, when you have to cross the wire, you're in combat mode. Boom, you're good. When you come back, then you give yourself the care you need to take off your warrior everything yeah. ethos and put on your father ethos or whatever it is that you're coming back to. Yeah. And we're just now starting to understand how that works in the military, right? But attorneys have been doing it for a long time. Yeah. You know, I, I know a lot of happy, well-adjusted attorneys as well as the ones who are all stressed <laughs> out all the time, right? And And the difference is that the ones who are happy, well-adjusted know how to, to take off, you know, attorney and put on father or husband or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. Hockey uh, player. Exactly. Have you seen the movie Mask by any chance? The Mask I with Ajibu Carey? That. Oh my gosh. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Like that, I, I thought of that immediately when you said that because you want to make sure you could take the mask off. And sometimes you wait so long that mask just won't come off, you know? It won't come off, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and this is a discipline like all the other, like, I mean, attorneys get this and so do warriors. But if you discipline yourself to stop being an attorney, you give yourself this whole window of opportunity. And maybe it's only five minutes. Yeah. Especially if you're in law school. You just need five minutes. Yeah. To do something else, right? Yeah. And that can change everything. I mean, it can, whatever it is. Oh, yeah. That, that five minutes that you're not being a law student or an attorney, or a warrior, or whatever that stressful thing is that you do, yeah, that can be life-saving. Yeah, definitely. Can you explain a little bit uh, practically how attorneys and law students could use music as self-care? Maybe give like an example as to how it would be applied? Sure. Um, so there's sort of two aspects of music. There's music as an intervention, where something's going so far south that you need some way to recover from that. Mm -hmm. And then there's music as a tool to help you like take a, a competitive leap forward to have an, a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. So most of the time what we get is a sort of remediation thing. It's like, <gasps> help me, Bill. I'm in this mess. Mm -hmm. So what I do in that case, and it happens to all of us, yeah. is I build up what I call silver bullet playlists. So four songs, maybe 20 minutes tops that have a specific intent. If one of those intents might be um, intervening with stress, then I'll build a playlist that gets me good and stressed. Now, that's a difference because most people say, oh, I'm stressed. I need to hmm. get out of it. Well, my way out of it is to say, let's let that stress go. Let's let it play. Let's see what happens. What's in that stress for me that I need right now? Because there's a negative side to that. Sure, it's, it incapacitates you. Stress is terrible. It really yeah. can take you down. But underneath all that, there's something good. And if you can quickly let all that stress go, the something good will emerge. Mm -hmm. It's nonlinear. You can't say, if I do this, then I'll have that. But you can say, if I do this, then all of that negative stuff will open a new space where something new can emerge. Uh -huh. And, <laughs> you know, attorneys are not so stupid. They're, yeah. they're, they're, <laughs> well, they're about, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, you've seen them, but they're about creative ideas yeah. and finding ways to, and, and 
trying to navigate a new path through existing laws and mm-hmm. figure out what, you know. So opening that creative ability is very important for attorneys. Yeah. To do that, you got to take all the stress out of it. So a silver bullet playlist for me will take me up a, up a slope, let's say it's a stress slope, up to a peak, and then let that stress go. Hmm. So I'll just build up, a I don't know, four songs that get me good and stressed. Um, <laughs> people think like Metallica, whatever. There's, <laughs> there's music that can get you really angsty. Yeah. Some of the anger music works really well for stress. But whatever that stress music is for you is going to be different than for me. Mm-hmm. It's the music that you love that's the most impact. So this is a really interesting thing to say to people. Well, what music stresses you out? Well, clearly the music you don't like. Yeah. So you might pick four songs that you just <laughs> really hate. And force yourself to listen to them. That's a good musical bath. Hmm. Because what will happen is your stress will engage with the music. And when the music ends, so will your stress. Hmm. And leave you in a place where you can do other things. So there's science behind that. Yeah. And after you listen to stressful music, now, is that where it ends? Or do you then listen to music that calms you? Yeah, you can do two things. If you are in in a place where you want to be calm and you want to actually change stress to relaxation. Yeah. Pick up after you've let the stress go. Yeah. Pick up something that relaxes you. Mm-hmm. Or if you're in a place where you want to turn that stress from stress to creativity, cause you've got a big paper due, take your stress music, play that, let it go. And then take the corner to something intellectual, like put on some classical music. Mozart is great for the mind, that kind of stuff. They say, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, lights you up. I've got a buddy who's schizophrenic and his intellectual music, <laughs> his intellectual music is metal. Yeah. Because it, it helps him slow his brain down enough to think mm-hmm. at a normal level. So his needs are different for that that corner than the rest of ours might be. That makes sense. Uh, I, can't, I can't even tell you what he listens to for stress because <laughs> you, go, you go crazy. But yeah. it works the same way. Back right? when I used to skateboard back in my high school days, I uh, used to skateboard while listening to classical music. I didn't know why. For some reason, it just worked for me. Yeah, there's science on why that works. But if you find your power music like that, oh my gosh, engage with that. Yeah. I, I find it's difficult to think when I've got words playing, mm-hmm. but if I've just got straight classical or something where it's, it's music only, yeah, I find that I can concentrate and write well enough. Sometimes the words distract me, and if I, if I want to use words, I'll use them probably in a sadness situation where I need mm-hmm. the words to help me feel the emotion. Yeah. Or in a fear or anger, words work well there too. The focus, uh, the focus music is different for all of us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like for my buddy, if it's Metallica for him, that helps him focus. Yeah. Cool. But <laughs> yeah, classic seems to be like the go-to or ambient. There's good ambient music out there that just kind of lets you, you know, float in a place. Yeah. And be productive there. Um, so people like my wife don't really listen to music. Uh, don't They say that they don't like music. I just say they haven't found the right music for them. Um, so how would you recommend people finding their playlists um, in, in their daily lives if they might not love music as much as you and me? It's a really great question. Um, we've, in the West, we've sort of put music in the background. You know, like the comic books, we leave it up on the shelf and we'll take it down when we need it. Mm-hmm. And then we're done, we'll put it back up there. Yeah. Um, we haven't really been given a chance to engage with music in, in America the same way that all their cultures are uh, given that chance. And... For whatever reason, education, perhaps, I don't know, the focus on STEM rather than STEAM, the arts aren't a big deal for us the way that they could be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's to our detriment because if we don't get people exposure early, then later on they go, well, what's the value? What's the point? Why would I go to the symphony? Mm -hmm. Um, You can unwind from that. And because we're humans, sometimes it takes a crisis. We We tend to learn well under stress. Which is exactly why boot camp and law school work so well. Yeah, <laughs> they help us. They help us learn well because we're stressed in that environment. Yeah, we're, we're pushing ourselves. Right, you have to exercise it in order to build it. Mm-hmm. So exercising your musical muscle can sometimes take a little bit of effort. It's like the person who says, "Why would I go to the gym? Why would I run?" You know, until you've actually done that and started to experience the results of it, it doesn't become clear for you. So turning someone who is sort of like, eh, "I don't care, music. It's in the background. It kind of works." into a music hunter, mm-hmm. well, that's a, that's a process. One of the best ways in for that, I've found, Chris, is movies. Yeah. You can sit down and watch a movie and then turn off the sound. If it's a movie that you know well, Disney, Harry Potter, whatever, turning off the sound gives you a whole different experience of that movie. Yeah. And it's not really a great one. 
even horror but movies. What you find is that even yeah, even especially horror movies yeah. like The Shining or whatever. Yeah. Turn off the soundtrack. It's a different thing. Oh, yeah. But if you know the movie, what you'll find is that in your head, you hear the sound. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we don't read lips, but if you know the movie well enough, like we know yeah. all the Harry Potter movies, we could almost say the dialogue. Oh, yeah. You know, along with the character. <laughs> so it's somehow, some of it's gotten in there. And by trying to take that sound out of it, you realize how flat the experience is. Yeah. If you really want to get creative with this, we have downtown um, an old theater with a little pipe organ in it. Sometimes they'll show silent movies in there. And they'll use the organ to provide the soundtrack for the movies. Hmm. If you can find an experience like that, that gives you a real insight into, well, first of all, how long those movies were, because, you know, we weren't doing anything else back in the whatever, 10s and 20s, nearly 1900s. Entertainment was going to the movies for three hours. Yeah. You know, that's a long movie. Yeah. But if you do that, you'll realize right away the whole variety of sounds that could go along with any particular scene in a movie. We've all seen those old scenes. The villain comes in yeah. and it says, and the, the, the dialogue comes up and says, I will get you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes, <laughs> right? So yeah. Y- y- it, it's a really comical thing, but it's a great way in to be able to experience the function of music that way. Yeah. It's completely live and created in the moment. That's true. Uh, my, it, during my 2L, I experienced that as well. Uh, you're saying? No, no, go ahead. I was going to say during my 2L... Uh, second semester, I I had a semester where I didn't do too good. Uh, I got the worst grades I got during law school. They weren't horrible, but they weren't ones I was proud of. And that really hit my ego, hit my spirit, hit everything about me. Just felt like, why am I here? Uh, that same day, I happened to go to the movie theater and I saw the title, The Greatest Showman. And I didn't know anything about the movie, didn't watch the trailer, didn't. I knew nothing about it. I'm not even a musical person. Like I, I love music, but I don't really watch musicals. By the time I left that movie, I felt better than I ever felt. And that's where I got the motivation to start a podcast. That's where I got a motivation to start my side businesses. And ever since then, it's been like everything has been a little bit better, you know, in every way. Yeah. That movie is incredible for the way that it engages music with um, the just the freaks of nature that are the people in the circus, right? Yeah. And. Okay, so I don't care if it's authentic or whatever, if P.T. Barnum was like that or not. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. But the, the music that's in there, oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. That is some of the most powerful music. Well, yeah, there's sing-alongs for that in the yeah. theaters. Do you know that? Yeah. They actually I, do sing-alongs. I teared up at the first song. And the first song, as you know, is like the first minute of the movie. And, I'm, I, and I went yeah. in there with no expectations. And it started. And I'm like, why is this happening? No. Yeah, what's happening? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So you had the experience. Was your wife with you? She was. And she hates musicals. That movie yeah. we watched over 10 times. She loves exactly. that movie. Yeah. Yeah. See? Oh, man. Same guys that did... Um, uh, L.A. St- no, what is it? Not L.A. Story, not L.A. Confidential, but uh, La La Land. Yes. Yeah. Same same composers and uh, oh wow. Yeah. They're incredible. It's that's it's, some good uh, stuff. Yeah. And it's amazing going into it when you don't when you're not expecting anything because it really blows you out of the water. Um, where could people go to kind of learn more about music and how it interacts with with the person? There's a ton of information out there. Um, I have some websites, of course, you can use. Yeah. Uh, musiccare.net is a good place for um, like sourcing information on music. And I, I blog a lot. So I tend to write subject specific blogs, blogs about stress, blogs about depression, um, two minute treatments for engaging with uh, road rage, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you Google me, you'll find all this. And there's actually an online course you can work through this too. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, music is a kind of a sacred responsibility. Um, this goes back again to the spiritual, but I see that that's really our opening and being able to treat ourselves as the incredible spiritual people that we are, you know, we have this, we have this built in stuff, consciousness, whatever it is, human spirit, call it that. But that's the thing that's really our juice and being able to engage that deeply, um, is, is a ceremonial experience for me. Yeah. So the course that I wrote for this, I set it up in the form of a rite. It's a ritual to use music like this. Mm-hmm. There, there's actually an, a, a huge purpose to doing it that's meant to unlock things like your experience in the, at the Greatest Showman. It's meant to surprise you and, and wake you up to things that you wouldn't be able to get any other way. Yeah. But with practice, you can get to those things reliably. Yeah. Like an actor, you can cry on demand, right? But it's coming from a genuine place. So the, the quest.musiccare.net uh, webpage will give you some insight on that. There's a bunch of front page stuff there too that's in front of the paywall that shows you what you're doing, mm-hmm. why you want to do that, how it works. 
So lots of opportunities. The American Music Therapy Association webpage is incredible for all of its stuff. Uh, that's more clinical. So if you're in a situation where you're dealing with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or autism, things like that, um, the AMTA page is great for those clinical interventions. And of course, there's lots of music therapists out there. So if you really want to get into this and work with somebody on it on a therapeutic clinical level, one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, go for that. But you can do this on your own, Chris. It's, yeah. You have a little bit of knowledge, or even if you don't, <laughs> you go to the movies and you, you're crying yeah. in the first five minutes of a movie. You're going, "What's happening to me?" Yeah, yeah. Well, what's happening is you've you've unlocked yourself. You know, you've gotten to that place where there's some real imp important stuff that you need. Yeah. Like you need to be able to access that. You did. Yeah. So I, that's what I teach people how to do that on their own. Yeah. And I can't even explain how, how true what you're saying is. Uh, even like two days ago, I was stressed about something. I, I do have four songs, five songs. I have, I, have, um, I have a station on Pandora that I use, and it always plays the same yeah. type of 20 songs that I like. Uh, and it changed everything. Um, is there anything that you would want to tell my audience uh, that comprises of uh, attorneys and law students that are going through kind of tough moments? Yes. Uh, those are not the toughest moments you're going to go through. Those are just practice for the real tough moments. Mm -hmm. And you're ready for them. The only reason they're coming to you is because you're ready for them. And you guys, it, it's not really good news, but every time you stumble through one of those, oh my God, what's happening to me now, and you get to the other end, mm -hmm. the most important thing is not whether you win or lose. The most important thing is that you made it through the process because now you're ready for the next most difficult process. And it's going to find you too. Mm -hmm. um, just from personal experience, my son, who's an attorney, uh, is also an officer in Marine Corps Reserve. And there are a lot of um, active duty suicides these days, as well as veteran suicides and every other kind. And when one of your Marines takes his own life, that really, really gets into you. Yeah. There's nothing that as a leader you can do about that. Mm -hmm. But as a human being, there's plenty you can do. And that at that moment, when you're squeezed that way, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's another one of those processes and it's going to happen. And all of your, all of the tough stuff you've been through is only there to give you the leg up on the next tough thing that you're going to hit. Yeah. And you can do this. You really can do this. Hats off to anybody who's in a track that is headed that direction because whether you're a soldier or an attorney, the, the process of getting you over those next difficult steps is the most important thing, not the result. Yeah. Well, that's true. And honestly, thank you. Uh, I, I can't even put into words how, how many people are going through tough times that just I know in my circle, in my law school. Now multiply that by every law school in the United States. I mean, oh, yeah. people need to address their, their mental health um, because everyone has mental health. Bill, thank you so much. I can say thank you a million times. It won't be enough. You're doing an amazing job. Uh, and I'm really excited to to just watch you. And if you write a book about this, I'll be the first one to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Thank you for having me on the show. And you know, anytime, just reach out. I'm here. Fantastic. Anytime too. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Very well. Bye. Bye-bye. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Mental health is so important. If you feel like you have any mental health issues, please seek help. Even if it's not a therapist, seek a friend or a mentor. Now, if you guys enjoyed this episode, follow me on Apple Podcasts, give it five stars in a review, and follow me on Instagram.